they are going to hyperinflate the dollar. And of course, that's going to create a problem for the US dollar as a, as a result because it is the reserve currency. This isn't Zimbabwe where you have one currency and that's it, that one particular country is involved. This is the US dollar. This is something that we need to be worried about even if we're not in the US. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is David Quintieri, the author of The Money GPS. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. It's great to have you. And you've been reporting a lot on your YouTube channel regarding the repo crisis. Now, kind of taking a macro view, how does the repo, what is the repo crisis to begin with, and how does it impact the average person? So basically, this is something going on under the hood. The Federal Reserve does open market operations, and they're constantly trying to manipulate interest rates, and they're basically interfering in the markets. And Zoltan, who's one of the most experienced people in this field, has basically come out with a few things recently. And what he suggested was that they're basically backing themselves into a corner, the Fed that is. And what we've done here is basically the Federal Reserve coming in and buying up the Treasury's uh, issuances of debt. So they're putting all this debt out there because you know the government's spending so much money. You've got the Federal Reserve buying it out, $80 billion a month of it. And then they're putting that back through the reverse repo operations. In the last one that was done was $351 billion in a single day. So you know that the market has this demand for these repo operations. And this is something that the Federal Reserve ultimately doesn't want to be doing because the, the market should be actually operating on its own, just like they shouldn't be buying $40 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities. But again, they have to do that because the system is broken. Now, for the average person, they really don't have to worry about it and ultimately they won't know a thing or two about this but you and i we know that this is something that behind the scenes under the hood it's going on and so the federal reserve back in 2019 when the repo crisis began they dismissed it they said there is nothing to worry about don't ask questions. A reporter raised their hand. They said, look, there's this repo thing going on. What do you have to say about it? And Jerome Powell said, nothing to see here. What kind of impact is it going to have on the economy? And again, why is it a concern? So basically, because of what the Federal Reserve has done, this has based with the money printing and so on, they've been buying up all of this garbage debt. And that has been supporting the system. But now there's been this demand through the repo operations that has basically skewed that and has prevented, potentially prevented their plans from happening. The market wants less money to be printed. At the same time, they want more money to be printed. They're really being backed into a corner right now. It's very convoluted. It's very complex, but I'm trying to simplify it. And basically what we're going to see is a continual uptick in the requests, in the demand for the Federal Reserve intervention. But they can't continue this forever. They are going to hyperinflate the dollar. And of course, that's going to create a problem for the US dollar as a, as a result because it is the reserve currency. This isn't Zimbabwe, where you have one currency and that's it, that one particular country is involved. This is the US dollar. This is something that we need to be worried about even if we're not in the US. So pay close attention. Now, with respect to hyperinflating the US dollar, I'm assuming you're meaning the the um, money supply. So hyperinflating the money supply. Do you see that? How do you see that impacting prices? Because we definitely have been seeing higher inflation right now, but it seems kind of extreme to think that we're gonna see hyperinflation anytime soon. 
You know, they've said that many times before, and yet it happens. You know, you have to look at the history behind it and realize that when faith is lost in the currency, it only takes a very short period of time before it goes from bad to worse. There have been many examples of this through history. I've noted many that have happened between one and two year time frames where it goes from, okay, you know, there's some heavy inflation to essentially worthless currencies. Now the US dollar has the reserve currency, the world status, it's probably not going to be necessarily overnight, but understand that this is something that will happen faster than most people are prepared for. So you will have a run on the dollar into other currencies, into other assets. That's going to happen. It's already, right now, it's been declining for years, 59% of total reserves for the world. And that has been declining for a period of time, and most people wouldn't think that this could ever happen. But if you look at the actual percentages, yes, US dollar still, by far, the highest, but it's changing. You're saying that there will be a rush out of the U.S. dollar into assets and other currencies. We're seeing an inflation of definitely asset prices right now with stocks and all of that and real, the real estate market. Um, now, with respect to other currencies, are there other currencies that are seem more attractive than the U.S. dollar or is kind of are all the currencies kind of in the same situation of being inflated right now? The only reason why the you know, why the actual U.S. dollar has been, let's say, better than the rest is because we're comparing to the rest. We're not comparing to something actual, real, and tangible. So if you look at your own country, take it 10 years back, 20 years back, 50 years back, you're seeing the devaluation of the currency. But if you compare it you know, on the dollar index, you're going to see this thing floating up and down. And you could say, no, David, you know, this, you're not right. You're not correct. Because look at the dollar index. Yes, we've been here before. But if you compare that to food prices, my goodness, wages have barely been going up. And actually, in real terms, if you factor in real inflation, they haven't been going up at all. They've been going down. And yet we've got food prices sky high. Even if you don't even factor in what happened 2020, 2020, one, just look at the food prices overall. They become more and more of uh, you know the disposable income for individuals. So what happens? You got more people on food stamps. Over 40 million people in the United States are on food stamps. Okay, this is a very serious situation that they don't want to talk about because they're giving the stimulus checks out because they're putting all of these different packages in place to just get through. They're putting a bandage on top of a very big problem. The wound needs to be resolved and healed. So you're gonna have other currencies that may be part of, let's say a portfolio or a basket that these countries hold. They might decide to hold more gold because they think, I don't trust the Euro, look at where it's going. I don't trust the Japanese yen. So you know what, I'm gonna hold a little bit of all these and I'm also gonna buy into some gold. That's what some countries have done. They've reduced their reserves of dollars and they've increased their reserves of gold. It all depends on the situation, of course, but that's most likely the continued trend for the foreseeable future. And there's also the talk of something like an IMF SDR to replace that. I know like Jim Rickards has talked about this before and others. Uh, this is absolutely a possibility. However, we need a major crisis, a major currency crisis to take place for them to have the excuse to bring that in. And mentioning this crisis, I've also heard the perspective of, yes, there's this huge bubble with the U.S. debt. There's this huge bubble in currencies right now. Currencies are being inflated. However, often that can last longer than we expect, you know. So what are some prudent steps people can take to kind of prepare for a worst case scenario, but at the same time realize that it might take longer for this to play out than than we imagine? Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of people have been preparing for inflation for a long time and they've wondered, you know, we've seen the stock market rising higher and higher, housing prices rising higher and higher. Why hasn't this happened yet? It's because it's not linear. It doesn't happen in a very straightforward fashion. You're not going to be able to predict exactly how this occurs. Like you've seen all the quantitative easing and all the stimulus that's been going on since essentially 2008, 2009 timeframe. And that had made its way into stocks, into uh, you know real estate, and of course into more speculative uh, you know avenues. 
And this is something that nobody really realized because the financial system basically failed during the financial crisis. There was no way to turn that around. So they papered over it. So the individuals out there, if they had been buying, let's say, a huge stash of just precious metals, well, those precious metals can maintain value, but they can't necessarily bring in income throughout that period of time. That's why there's some people who love dividend stocks. The dividend stocks brings them in some returns over that period, and they hope that these stocks appreciate at the same time. Real estate, people who are getting into real estate, they're not necessarily worrying about the appreciation and so on, although they, I should say they shouldn't be worrying about it because they're getting that monthly cash in with their, you know, the renter, hopefully, paying their bills. And then you've got, of course, businesses. If that business is still operating, they're able to bring in monthly revenue. There are many different asset classes. Each has their own advantage. And that's why I talk about this a lot, to make sure that we're always diversifying in these different asset classes. Your percentages and what you want in your portfolio, that's up to you. But I just think it's important to not just look at one asset class and understand that there are benefits in all of them. Now, when it comes to alternative currencies, for example, like gold and silver as money, right? Um, there's also Bitcoin, and we've recently seen a quite, and you've been reporting on this, quite a big drop in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. What do you make of that? Is Bitcoin more of a speculative asset, or is it actually an alternative, kind of like gold is? So I see it to be, like, there's the whole debate of gold versus Bitcoin, and basically gold is an ancient relic. And Bitcoin is the new gold. And I don't see that at all. I think they should both be looked at completely and entirely separately. So what we have today with Bitcoin's price, just the price action, that's speculation. It is absolutely speculation. However, now that we're seeing more institutions getting in and so on, they are starting to diversify what they have, micro strategy uh, being one particular example. Of course, you had what happened with Tesla and so on. So these companies are starting to buy it up. But the average person throwing in $1,000 or $500, even you know many years ago, this was all speculation based on price. But if you understand the original Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, if I paraphrase the first sentence or two, essentially what it said was peer-to-peer -peer cash, electronic cash, uh, you know, between two people without the knowledge of a third party or financial uh, institution. That's my butchered uh, version of it. Okay. And what does that mean? It means no banking system. It means me and you together without you know, the bills that say Federal Reserve note on top of them. We don't need that. Okay. So in that way, it operates in a fantastic manner, just like gold and silver can be as well. Technically, I can give my gold to you and you can give it to me and nobody else has to know about it. And that's fantastic. Now, this has different advantages and disadvantages and so on. But I think we need to really separate it like that and understand why Bitcoin has its advantages and understand where gold comes into play as well. So is there then a room? You mentioned how the recent price action, that's more speculation. Um, is there room just for holding Bitcoin as like an alternative asset and not just to speculate on price? I mean, absolutely. A lot of people do right now today. They hold on to their Bitcoin and maybe even use their Bitcoin as currency. They may buy things online with it, especially if they bought Bitcoin at an extremely low price. They may be using that. The trouble is because it's such a deflationary asset, why spend it today when you know it's going to be worth something tomorrow? Okay, that's the trouble uh, that I think that we've got into be between the original idea for Bitcoin and where we are at today. They say, you know, the there's new types of Bitcoin available and they're faster transactions and they're cheaper and so on. But do you really want to be transacting in something like, for example, the pizza? Somebody had bought a pizza, I forget, you know, 10,000 Bitcoin or something. And now today the guy would have been worth, you know, mega millions and so on. You know, you can't really see into the future that far. And I'm sure at that time he probably wasn't thinking anything of it. But that's what we're into right now. So I think people uh, have really changed the outlook on Bitcoin. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We just need to recognize that. 
Do you think that is a fundamental issue with Bitcoin that it is so def deflationary? You know, I don't necessarily see it to be a problem. It is a problem in if you're go going to use this as some sort of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Because why would I give you, we agree to terms on something, $100 of Bitcoin today, and knowing that that's going to be $200 tomorrow, it kind of doesn't make sense. So in that case here, you know, I would be, uh, you know, a little cautious around the, the use of Bitcoin in that respect. I think that people should be um, using it in the way that they feel. For me, for gold, I can say that there's no reason to be spending your gold. Don't spend your gold. Don't use your gold because you want to save that in an, uh, on an indefinite time frame. There are those who say, you know, you wait for the peak, you sell at the peak and so on. I actually believe if you read uh, Robert, Kiy <clears throat> Robert Kiyosaki's book, Fake, he talks about actually having gold for an indefinite period as savings, true savings. That's the difference between uh, myself and some others out there who, who, you know, try to go through the cycles. I think it's a savings vehicle. And then when it does come to more than just savings, but investing, what is your perspective on like some of the, at least the best assets that you're looking at right now? Right. So I've been talking about this on my channel uh, for a while, but I, you know, the joke was that people should be buying two by fours because the price of lumber is going to go up. And of course we saw how crazy the price of lumber and other commodities as well. Why? Because the demand of commodities had increased. The prices of those commodities were historically very low in comparison to equities. At the same time, you've got all the shortages, supply chain problems, and so on. So it's like this trifecta happening all at once. And the media is only highlighting the one very important fact that there's supply chain problems. But I think we need to look a little level deeper and realize, compare, looking at these commodities compared to equities compared to all these different other assets the prices had been so so low and let's be honest the prices were high but compared to those other things they were very low so you've got the speculation behind it there's always going to be people who are putting their money behind these speculative assets and futures and so on that are going to push the prices up or in some cases push it down. But that's really key here. So I've been talking about that for a while. Now the prices of those commodities, some of them like lumber have come down. So I would be careful on that. But I think that we should look in general, no matter what, you know, when you're watching this video, look for what is undervalued and try to trim your holdings in what is overvalued. And speaking of what's undervalued, would you say that gold and silver, I mean, kind of being commodities as well, do you see them as undervalued right now? Absolutely. They're the most manipulated assets on the face of the earth. There's no doubt about it. We've, we've known that for many, many years. And I think it's uh, imperative for people to really address that, to know that the prices have been manipulated. They could be manipulated for even longer. And so do not rely on that price to necessarily spike higher. You can't say gold is going to be 5,000 on this date, 10,000 on this date. We need to know that we are saving our money in something that ultimately has true value. There's no way to deny that. I could take my gold anywhere in the world. It is recognized. It is valuable. Okay, now what the price is tomorrow, I have no idea, but I know that it has value. It has intrinsic value. It could be used as a currency. It could be used in, in industrial. It's always used as jewelry. There's so much importance surrounding gold and silver as well. And so people need to be aware of that. So I, I say, don't worry about the price necessarily. When you have your portfolio allocation, you should be always looking at having some level of precious metals in there simply because it is the best savings vehicle. And we'll put a link in the description if people are wanting to learn more about precious metal manipulation and really the debate behind, you know, what the extent of it is and everything like that. Um, now, in your perspective, is if I'm hearing you right, you're saying precious metals should be savings. You're not really speculating that the price is going to go higher kind of because you see that it, the price is manipulated and that you can't really count on the price necessarily going higher anytime soon because of that. Is that your view? That's part of it for sure. But I look at the cultures of the East and you see what they do. 
every time there's a wedding, every time there's a major celebration, these families keep wealth within themselves by giving each other these gold coins. And are they really necessarily caring if it's 500 today, if it's 600 tomorrow? No, they take the gold, they pass it down generation to generation to generation. And every time, every generation, that pile gets bigger and bigger and bigger. A lot of the countries in the West, they don't do that. These cultures don't do that. But the East, they have done, done that for you know hundreds, thousands of years. And so that's a different situation that I think is fantastic because – they're not going to sell it. Now, they don't put all their money into it. So they don't necessarily worry about the fluctuations, but they're always keeping that. They're always passing it down. And that's the way that I look at it. So maybe it's not jewelry, maybe it's bullion, but it applies the same way. So I, I look at it like a completely different perspective than, you know, buying GLD stock. No, 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 that's, that's a totally different thing. You can do that, people do do that. They speculate on the price. They think, that, okay, inflation's coming in. I'm going to buy GLD stock and I'll sell it at a later date and so on. We're talking about different things here ultimately, uh, but but that's the way I look at it. I think that's so important of really having an asset outside of the financial system because so much of our lives are digital you know, now. And it's like this is a way to actually come back to reality with your finances, just holding something in your hand and realizing, okay, I do have something of real value. Exactly. It's so true. You know, we, we're all in this digital world and everybody's so used to it and so on. But having that tangible asset is so important. I always say when all else fails, people turn to gold. That's part of the reason why there hasn't been as much demand for it right now. Because if you look through 2020, you had this big crash and then it roared back up so fast. And you know, yes, gold has done relatively well over this period, but certainly equities have performed much better. But you've looked at the whole belief that, oh, don't worry, the Federal Reserve is going to take care of it. Don't worry, the government's going to take care of it. Once that belief has basically gone out the window, that's when gold will see a much greater demand. All right. Well, David Quintieri, we really appreciate your time today. Uh, if people would like to hear more of these interviews, they can go to libertyandfinance.com in the left-hand corner, put their name and email to get notified of all the new interviews we're doing. If people would like to find you and your book, where can they go? Absolutely. Just go to my YouTube channel. It's probably the best place, The Money GPS, and you could see me there posting new videos every day. Fantastic. David, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thank you very much. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, zero complaints, licensed and bonded for physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin, satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs.